being in the country for 14 years um, illegally and not being able to travel or to really do much, honestly, it was really hard. Climbing was like, okay, I can actually embrace this. Like, I don't have to like give them a document every time I try to go to school, right? It's just like, oh, you can't really do that, right? So everything I've tried, it was just like a no. But in climbing, it was like, yes. What's going on, everyone? I'm Nils Mindnick, and this is the Backcountry Podcast, a show aimed at providing insight into the outdoor industry by interviewing people who operate within it. Today, I'm going to be talking with Maiza Lima, known for her climbing, but she is also much, much more than that. Having grown up in Brazil and moved to the U.S. at an early age to escape poverty, I'm sure she has a super cool perspective on life, her outlook on the world, and I am stoked to catch up. Yeah. First off, having a unique name myself, did I pronounce yours correct? Perfect. Maiza. Okay, yeah. sweet. Cool. Thank you. <laughs> On paper, I was like, oh, Maiza. And then I heard someone say Maiza, and I was like, I'm going to make a mental note of that Maiza, one. Maiza, maize, unicorn, popcorn, anything corn. <laughs> anything corn. Okay. Oh, maize. Okay, yeah, yeah. I get it. There's yeah, a connection. Yeah. Sorry. There's a connection. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I'm kind of, I'm psyched to just like, dive into a couple topics today but first off I was sort of scrolling through your Instagram getting a bit of context for catching up with you today and elephant in the room I want to know more about this cabin and the cabin project and if you could just give me a quick cliff notes as to what the hell's going on there because it looks like a big project put on your seat belt because that's a long one I'm gonna try to be quick now <laughs> yeah went to Kentucky to climb in 21 I believe no, 2017, and camped in the rain, and it sucked, but I loved the area, so my husband started just looking at, you know, pieces of land that we could camp on our own, and found a deal for very cheap, it was a steep hill, nobody wanted it, so bought it, sight and scene, cool, drove there to build a nice shed, didn't even have a place to park, because it was like, <laughs> so steep <laughs> everybody's like you guys are crazy so we're just like fighting and in like a week we built this like shed that we bought like the plans you know online 200 hundred dollar plan loved it but you know it was just a shed um and i said i want a cabin he was like girl we have no money and i was like if we just decide to build this cabin it's gonna happen went back home he started drawing it we started building windows at home 42 of them doors stairs everything at home even the kitchen was fully built at home. Um, the roofing as well, we brought it from Montana, 27 hours drive in 2021. We had 30 days to build this thing. And we also paid someone else to come and help us to frame, who did not show up. So <laughs> he says, well, what do you want to do? We can just vacation and uh, climb. And I said, no, 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 we're here to build a cabin. We're going to do the best we can. He said, there's no way we can finish it in 30 days. I was like, if we cover it, waterproof it, we can come finish the next year. Let's just do whatever. And then excavator guy says, can't show up until like Saturday because it's raining a lot and it's really steep. Well, concrete arrives tomorrow. So we started digging and we dug the entire foundation by hand. It's pretty deep, like six full like holes. And we were just like destroyed under the rain, was able to do it. I think it was like we were digging like all day that day through the night because the guy was arriving the next morning and he arrives there, we're just like destroyed. We had to figure out how to get the concrete down the holes. That's a whole nother story. Um, we spent all day in the rain just trying to get all this stuff done. And then by day 12, when everything dried, not, not the rain stopped, but you know, the concrete dried, <laughs> we started framing and we worked 14 hours a day, every day. Um, we couldn't sleep because we couldn't close our hands because we were working so much. It was summer, it was awful. Um, but we're super stoked, and the last day we closed the doors and everything was done, other than obviously the inside of the cabin. But yeah, we were able to build the bridge, um, the entire driveway, the whole cabin in 30 days. <laughs> Why 30 days? What's up with that? <laughs> um, he was in the military, and that's the maximum of vacation he could take in a year. Um, so his entire vacation for the whole year was... Um, Training. 
Um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, honey, this is going to be so good yeah. for your mind. Yeah, yeah, we and were training. Body. Yeah, we were just like literally eating cereal and drinking aolates every day. So it was pretty bad. <laughs> oh my god, <laughs> that's insane. So then, I mean, you kind of got the structure and the frame up in 30 days. Did it have like, what about the plumbing? Is there like a septic system? Is like, did you have? A, is there electrical? So the next year, we came back for 30 days. <laughs> An annual 30-day build-out, yeah, blow-out. Yeah, yeah, and then we did the whole plumbing, uh, finished the inside, uh, did the electrical put, um, water, which also was all hand-dug <laughs> the entire hill to, like, get the water pipes to the house. Oh, um, interesting. All the plumbing lines, everything was hand-dug. We just didn't have the money to, like, get nice machines or get anybody there. Um, so we had to just deal with it, right? Yeah, and we finished everything, and the same year we started um, renting it, and it's always popping people love it it's just a gorgeous like kind of yeah. treehouse looking cabin so yeah. yeah yeah for anyone listening or watching you should totally check it out on amazonia 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 <laughs> i came from the, the amazon yeah amazon. Oh, okay. yeah so it inspired me because it's like kind of a rainforest yeah you know yeah. well you know that's kind of an interesting sort of a good segue too because i feel like that mindset and effort to just like put your head to the grindstone and bust down on a cabin to be like this is what we got to do. I'm going to freaking do it. Let's bring it back maybe to your childhood and early days because a mindset like that oftentimes I think comes from an early age and what maybe like an early life can look like. And maybe let's just like dive into what it was like growing up in Brazil and maybe let's, I don't know, let's start out the story there. One of the reasons why Kentucky reminds me so much of the Amazon is the first year that we were there in the shed, no electricity, no running water, no flushable toilets, right? I'm, I was so used to it. Um, growing up in Brazil, I grew up literally in the jungle with no electricity, no running water. We had to hike to the river to um, do laundry. My husband likes to tell our friends that I grew up wrestling in anacondas and high-fiving monkeys, and I'm like... That's, Which is also true, <laughs> Sounds course. very good in a resume, but it's not true. <laughs> um, but, you know, it was like, I, I had to start working really young. I was eight years old, and I was already, like, selling mangoes on the side of the, the highway just to, like, help my parents and um, whatever I could. Um, by the age of 13, I already had a job at a cashier, like, at a store as a cashier, um, and finished high school at, like, 15 years old, just because I'm, like, always so focused on what I'm doing, and like, I just feel like a big responsibility, you know, for myself and my family, but... It was, it was very difficult. I remember like days that my mom was crying because she didn't know what to feed us. And you know, like it was rough um, days that I woke up and half of the wall in our house was falling off because the structure wasn't good and you know, it was raining and you just had to put a tarp and try to fall back asleep or whatever. And I think ultimately that led my mom and I to like, you know, look for something better. And it's it was a big sacrifice to leave everything behind. And we thought we were just going to leave our family for a couple of years and just try to make it better for them and for ourselves and have a, build ourselves a home or whatever and study my brothers and go back. But the reality is just very different. And we had, you know, we just kept on staying longer and longer just for many different reasons. And at some point, I just called the U.S. my home and I just couldn't see myself going back because... I didn't actually have a home there. I didn't know anything. Everything there was like kind of the past. And mm. I didn't know how I was going to live there again. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And then it was like fighting to stay here. Because when you come here the way we did, you don't know when you're going to be sent back home. Mm. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. you're embarrassed to tell anyone anyway about it, right? Um, yeah. And so it was like a long time of just like kind of trying to stay like as hidden as you can, you know, like just put your head down and just like work. Yeah. And and just hope that someday like your outcome is going to change. Yeah. Yeah. Very much maybe like a fight or flight period in a way. Very much. How long did that like what age did you start coming to the U.S. and like how long did that period last for in a way until you know obviously at some point you've found your footing i was 17 i had just turned 17 when we arrived and instantly i had to start working 
because I had to. <laughs> and I, yeah, that, that lasted forever. I, I was 26 when I actually started climbing just because I needed something else in my life. I needed a challenge. I needed, I needed something else as an identity other than just being a housekeeper. And I think that it, that's when I was just like, that was my first time trying anything with adrenaline and sports or anything. And it just, it like consumed me. It was just like, oh my God, like I can identify as something else or I can do something else as well. Real quick, I guess also another question as well with the whole like climbing thing and maybe culturally in Brazil, we're like, I mean, it doesn't seem like there was maybe like a sports team and stuff like that where you're growing up, but were you, were you and your family kind of, I guess, were you like pretty active as a child in a way? Yeah. You know what I, I mean? Like, yeah. I ran away from my dad a lot when he was trying to throw rocks at me. <laughs> <laughs> My only activity. Good call. I, Good call. My, Builds agility. I, yeah. <laughs> I, was, I was always playing on the streets, right? Like, there yeah. wasn't, like, anything organized, obviously. It was a very, very tiny village in the middle of nowhere. I remember, like, making my own soccer balls because I wanted to play with my friends, and we didn't really have one. Um, and that's okay, the kind yeah. of thing. We're always very creative on making our own toys, per se, or, mm -hmm. you know, just playing <laughs> baseball or basketball, and, like, you should see the, the stuff we're using to play those mm -hmm. games. Mm -hmm. it, so I was actually... Active. I was very involved with the community, with like the school and everything, but there wasn't like, like a sport per se. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah. Totally. Yeah. So climbing was like the first ever time that I was introduced to like sports or fitness in my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What was that like? What was your first kind of like introduction to climbing? Where Where were you? <laughs> what like What was that day like? <laughs> uh, I was I. I remember like taking to a mountain to hike and it was like, I think it was just a mile hike, but it was just like, wow, these mountains, people walk these things. This is so cool. And from that day on, that's all I did <laughs> until I felt like the need to do something more extreme. And my friend said, hey, my dad, he's done the mountaineers eight, like when he was 18, he's now 50, but he has magazines and I think they still exist. They founded, you know, brands and stuff in Washington. But I was like, well, give me the magazine. And she gave me. And I swear to God, like, I, I, I think I had my first computer then. You know, I didn't know how to use it. I didn't know how to use Google, per se, right? And so all I did, I was able to, like, pull their website and look for anything that said climbing. And then there was something that said sport climbing course. Could have Googled it but didn't know any better. Yeah. So I signed up and just waited to show up to it. Okay. Showed up to it. They were like doing an indoor like climbing thing where I was like, this is so scary. I went, I think halfway up, maybe just like right there, <laughs> 10 feet. <laughs> is this good enough? They're like, just whatever you feel comfortable. Right there, just lower me please, you know? Um, but at the same time, you know, those adrenalines, like those feelings of like challenge, like really stuck with me and that's what brings you back right you're like well I've done something that was scary for me but I really want to do it again so they're like hey sign up for the alpine basic alpine climbing course I just thought it was more rock climbing signed up <laughs> oh god <laughs> showed up again to the clubhouse had this huge list of gear and started spending all my money in it didn't really didn't understand I was like man I'm gonna be climbing rocks in these like giant boots you know mountaineering boots <laughs> And all of a sudden that year I was climbing all of like the, the volcanoes in Washington and okay. every weekend I was like in the mountain climbing like glaciers and stuff like that. And then did the intermediate course, like became a climb leader for them. It was cool. Loved the challenge. Really got into rock climbing, like sport climbing. And I was like, yeah, I think I like this better than walking with a heavy pack all the time. You don't say. You yeah. don't say. That's so savage. Your like first introduction was the climbing gym then into like. Yeah. Alpinism. Alpinism, yeah, <laughs> the yeah. Worst yeah. And, and I, to, to be to honest, okay, <laughs> when we did the clubhouse sport climbing thing, I didn't know climbing gyms existed yet. So when it rained and we couldn't get outside for like our first like climbing day or whatever, we went to a climbing gym. I put on my helmet and all my quick jaws. Good call. <laughs> and they're like, uh, you can just keep that on your, you know. <laughs> Don't well, they wanted to on. blend in. Exactly. You know? <laughs> I know. I feel like, and maybe you probably could talk more about this too, like there's been so many people that I've seen that are new to climbing or like, and kind of even myself when I first got into climbing, it was like, 
al- alpinism and trad climbing and multi-pitch climbing is what I thought I wanted to do. So yeah. that's where I went. It's like the extreme. Yeah, the yeah. Extra, you know, <laughs> oh, okay, cool. I've been bouldering in the gym. Mm-hmm. I want to summit now. Yeah, big wall. <laughs> big wall. <laughs> Just summit. <laughs> And I per- like personally, I've got I climb a little bit, and like I've gone full circle as well. We change a lot. Yeah, it's interesting how even hearing your story too. And I think I don't know why. Like, why does that happen? Why does everyone go from the gym into debatably the gnarliest, most kind of brutal form of we climbing? Don't know better. <laughs> <laughs> my th- I don't know. My, kind of my theory too is like that uh, community, maybe the alpinism and the the trad climbing community is, is just probably a high return over rate. <laughs> so hardcore, the, the, it's called hardcore. You know, the, the mentors are just getting everybody that doesn't know any better and saying, Hey, come on along. It's great. No, no don't. Oh, limestone. No, you don't want to deal with that. <laughs> like you want nothing to do with that stuff. That's boring. <laughs> yeah, for sure. You know, and the thing is like, just like Salt Lake, I'd say, and like Colorado, like Washington has like this, like, extreme like outdoor folks where they're like you can't just be a climber and not be a nice climber a skier and a mountain biker (laughs) otherwise like who are you need to be an ultra runner (laughs) and and maybe if you're not working towards a phd (laughs) i know i know so it was it was a lot and like being so new at everything i wanted to embrace everything because i wanted to be considered the outdoor person blah 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 and i was just like burning myself out so much trying to like embrace all these like sports all together and obviously spending every cent I had trying to do that and I think it got to a certain point where I was so burnt out that I was just like what is it what is my priority here like what do I want to do and like I have to pick things like I have to choose because I can't do it all you know I still have to work so yeah that's when I decided no more FOMO let's just do rock climbing because you like rock climbing Cool. Let's do that. How long did it take you to get to that point? Um, I'd say like five years. Okay. Yeah. I yeah. feel like I just got there and it took like 10, maybe 15 <laughs> yeah. years. So yeah. Good job. It's, <laughs> it, it depends. And, and it really depends who you're around. I think moving out of Washington and having to be stuck in Great Falls, Montana, really like took me out of like that entire circle. And it was like, hey, here, you're by yourself now. Just breathe for a little bit and really like think about these things. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it forced me to do that. I yeah, think. get some perspective. Mm-hmm. Is there a way you felt like finding climbing? Are you listening to you talk and maybe getting a little perspective on your your origins? Was climbing maybe one of the first things that you felt was yours or you had full control over in a way? Maybe ownership. Like it was yeah. almost like a. Privacy isn't the right word, but maybe ownership is the right word. I think that's a great way to put it. Um, I think that being in the country for 14 years um, illegally and not being able to travel or to really do much, honestly, it was really hard. It was just like you just felt like... Just have that cloud. Yeah, over you. yeah. Like you were just always just in fear. You couldn't really do anything. And as, as soon as you embrace something like climbing that has so much adrenaline and you feel like you can thrive and you can push yourself on something that's like no matter what you who you are, like nothing's gonna interfere with like your desire to just, you know, keep going. Climbing was like, okay, I can actually embrace this. Like I don't have to like give them a document every time I try to go to school, right? It's just like, oh, you can't really do that, right? So everything I've tried, it was just like a no. But in climbing, it was like, yes. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) We don't care who you are. (laughs) Just go rock climbing. Like, it's your own thing, right? Like, you hold yourself accountable. That's it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it seems that, obviously, things probably started clicking with climbing because that's kind of why we're here today, right? You've sort of like built a life or part of your life around, yeah. around this sport. And, and, um, I guess maybe my first question to kind of building off of that ownership, uh, purpose question is, do you feel like the, let's say the exposure to risk mm-hmm. and your perception of risk through your early life, did that help give you a bit of confidence as far as maybe setting lofty goals or not being afraid to reach further with your climbing? I think so. I think I've always been a little bit like that. I'm like a risk taker. You know, yeah. I really believe in 
just like diving into things and just seeing where you're going to land. <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? Cause like in a certain way, I think a lot of people maybe get into climbing and if they gain a little bit of traction, then they kind of stall out because mm -hmm. they're afraid that mm -hmm. ego or perception or their yeah. physical ability is going to hold them back. Like, mm -hmm. Oh, I don't want to set the goal to yeah. climb that hard because what if yeah. I fail? You well, know? Yeah. And that's the thing. Like I, I've never really set that many goals. Like I sucked so much when I started climbing that I was just like, man, if I could ever climb a 510 outside, I'm going to be the happiest person in the world. I'm never going to climb anything else. <laughs> yeah. Because it just, it didn't seem feasible ever for like a year or more, you know, just being in the gym all the time. And it just never clicked. So like, you know, I wasn't doing it like in the pursuit of anything. I was doing it because I could hang out with my friends because I could feel strong. But obviously there's the desire to push yourself, right? Yeah. And I think and and that's what gets you back over and over and over again. But climbing, you're never satisfied. So then you push yourself to the next level and you're like, Psh, now I need to climb this hard and now I need to climb this hard. So it's like that constant push yourself, but never in my life I thought that that's was going to become my world and I was going to be able to make a living out of that. And so I think going like open-minded into it really helped for me to not just like get over myself too much. Yeah. Did you have like, um, I guess my first question is, did you have a turning point when you felt like it started to click where you thought, oh, I, I kind of, I get this now. I, I understand what the pieces are to go beyond. Yeah, I think there were two main like events in my climbing that really clicked for me. It was the first time that I allowed myself to do a mini project and actually take falls outside because for the first two years I was terrified of leading, so I would cry and come down. No and way. yes, so I never finished a lead. I don't think maybe like maybe like a five eight. I don't know. So the first thing I actually sent outside was a five twelve because it was overhanging, and I thought it was a ten D. So I was like, it's steep. I'm going to take falls on this thing. I'm going to climb it, you know? So when I found out I was 5'12", that's when I realized I could actually rock climb. Yeah. And the only thing that was holding me back was my fear. So then I started, I put the entire next season into getting over the fear and climbing as many 5'11s as I could because I had not climbed one, like, on lead. And so that's all I did. It, I was just like, okay, I'm going to check all these boxes and make sure that I'm solid with my head to then like pursue more mm -hmm. but I never had a chance to because I never had a mentor or like an actual climbing partner to like pursue anything with me so I was just always all over the place mm -hmm. and when we moved to Montana I saw this route and it was beautiful didn't know what it was it wasn't anywhere like Montana's not really like talking about their grades okay their routes so saw it and I told my husband I was like that route is so cool one day I'm gonna climb that I don't care if it's 5'9 or if it's 5'13 I'm gonna climb it I think one year late, I found out it was like a 13B, whatever. And I was just like, called all these guys like that I knew kind of climbed on and off, like around like Great Falls where I had moved to. They're all like, it's too hard. We can't like, I don't want to try. And I was like, man, I need someone, you know? And so I just had like weird, strange people, whoever, to just give me a bit like here and there to project this thing <laughs> until I felt like I was ready to send it. And then I was just like, babe, we need to go camp by the canyon and tomorrow I'm going to send that route, you know, and he totally went with me and I sent the route and I was just like, okay, what it takes Sick. is like the dedication and like my biggest fear with like wanting to project and that it always happens is I don't have the time. I don't have the partners to like um, invest on the routes with me. It's such, I think people maybe undermine that too, is the investment. Like I'm curious what, a how it is for a full-time sport climber or the, the golden example that we all see is it's mm -hmm. like the power couple and yeah. that's all they do. Yeah. And you see that a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, yes. but like, <laughs> but I think the reality is, and it's interesting you bring this up cause I've I've been running into that. I was trying to get back into sport climbing last fall mm -hmm. and just the logistics to commit to picking the route that you're stoked on. So you yeah. don't burn out. Yeah. And then also just lining up the consistent days of thinking like, oh, okay, if I want I'll be rested on Wednesday, but yeah. Who the fuck's free at 10 a.m. on a Wednesday? I don't Nobody. know. <laughs> I think that's that's the biggest problem. It's like it's like it's, an unsung like struggle. It that's is. <laughs> yeah, and that has always been my biggest problem. I just don't have the chance to project 
because I'm never in the same place and I don't have people that are going to work the same thing with me like ever. Yeah. So it's the inconsistency. How have you tried to overcome that? I've tried. I haven't tried. <laughs> I, <laughs> I've tried I everything. That I just <laughs> like the last three years, all I've done was travel and work and travel and all my work is traveling. So when I'm actually home, I need to be home with my family. And I think that's the biggest barrier, you know, and I've really tried to get my husband to come belay me, but um, I don't think he's so psyched. <laughs> so I just don't want to force it. You yeah. know, like I think that um, he's moved on from it in a way. And so I, I don't want to make that like a commitment. You know, I don't want to be home and be like, let's go rock climbing. Yeah, it so, becomes a burden at that yeah, point. Exactly. Mm. So just trying to find other things and just hoping that someday it will just line up. You know, I'm like, now I'm back in Washington. Hey, maybe I'm going to have friends that go to a certain well enough that I, it can just work out. Mm -hmm. So let's hope. Yeah, let's hope. <laughs> <laughs> have you considered bouldering? Bouldering. Man, okay. <laughs> so first four or five years in climbing, refused to boulder. Hell no. This thing is hard and stupid and it's blah 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 and pads are ugly exactly all this thing like you just don't fall on pads like whatever and i think it was just like my ego talking like you're so weak at this like don't do it um refused would go to the climbing gym sometimes partners would be like hey can't come would go straight home instead of <laughs> bouldering when i moved to montana that's all i had so guess what started bouldering use it for my training constantly boulder way more than rope climb yeah so much better <laughs> yeah i know it's funny how that you're just like what it's almost like whatever you have yeah. at your hands i feel like if you're passionate enough about it yes you just like find something that's gonna work you're like okay it's raining out today yeah. i guess i'll damn it 20 minutes on the hangboard is better than nothing it's uh. so true <laughs> i i mean the, the hardest thing i've climbed it was just during like covid lockdown i was hangboarding at home and doing core exercises, like, constantly. I was the fittest I've ever been. Left. I think a lot of us were. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, no traveling. That's all you can do. That's, this is awesome, in a way, right? And left, like, that lockdown just, like, so strong. You know, just, like, ready to crush. So, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> That's awesome. Can you, okay, so you said that you, um, in, in Great Falls, you kind of climbed your, like, first project. Mm hmm sort of like personal best hard route mm -hmm. what was maybe the stepping stone or the steps you started to experience and take that made you realize and feel that you were entering the professional climbing community mm -hmm. in a way because there is there's kind of a maybe a divide at least there from is. my perspective mm -hmm. and I come from snowboarding and, and we talk about it all the time that there is sort of this like pros versus not versus but mm -hmm. there's like pros and civilians yeah. in a way yeah. and there's sort of like two different worlds yeah. that operate and yeah. so I'm curious what was that like maybe entering the professional space and starting mm -hmm. to meet other mm -hmm. people in that world yeah first of all just to clarify definitely a civilian that had a little taste of pro but I yeah. think and I think and it's like again it's like a blurred line in yeah. snowboarding there's a huge conversation right now as oh. to like what's a pro snowboarder even mean? You know, what is that? And I'm sure that's it's true. similar in climbing, but yeah. like maybe that's what I was trying to say more like the community in the world mm -hmm. or the, the, mm -hmm. that, that realm is yeah. the right way to yeah. put it. And I think that like what I've noticed is like the amount of like discipline that you put into it. Mm. It's what counts, right? Mm -hmm. When you watch a professional climber, they eat and breathe climbing. They're so disciplined. They're so focused. They won't. They will not eat the donut. They, <laughs> they will hangboard twice a day. They're just like so dedicated, like in such a beautiful way. But it's it's not for all of us, you no. know. Like I will eat the donut, <laughs> and I very much community focused in climbing, and which is sick. Which yeah, it's like I much rather take my friends that never climbed outside to climb outside than go try a project because. That's cool. I'm going to have a much better experience, mm -hmm. right? Yes, I like to try hard, mm -hmm. but it's not feasible all the time. Mm -hmm. And like, if you don't have those awesome experiences, like what, what else are you taking with you? So, but yeah, it's like, there is this huge division and it's just like, how focused are you and what are you willing to compromise, right? And 
during COVID, it was, yeah, it was like perfect to like train because you can really hang out with anybody or do anything with anybody anyway. So might as well get really strong. And, and that's when you see, right? You're eating well, you're training, you're sleeping a lot. It's like the perfect recipe versus when you can just hang out with anybody and go about doing your own shit. You end up like not really climbing the hardest, you know? But overall, just happier. <laughs> Can you expand on that? Because that's also, I think, uh, maybe an interesting space that a lot of climbers and I think anyone that's like dedicated to a passion mm -hmm. end up in is that there's sort of this balancing act in mm -hmm. a way between how how hard do you want to focus on the the task, the sport, whatever yeah. it is, yeah. and like it that comes at kind of a sacrifice as far as even a friends personal life yeah like diet everything yeah. you know yeah. did you end up did you kind of ever get really psyched to an extent that you just ended you just casted into the rabbit hole in that space oh a thousand percent and i think that's when i started climbing i spotted a huge community big brazilian community church community like i was with these people 100 percent of the time and then I started climbing and I wanted to go train and I wanted to go do a training hike and climb and do and go on the weekends somewhere. And I was missing friends' birthday parties. I was missing every single event. I was missing everything. Life. I, I was missing yeah, I was missing life. And like like I ended up not doing things for my mom. Like there was a lot of that, you know, just absolutely so focused because I'm also like that. I'm just so focused on something that I really want that like I forget about everything else. It's just like that tunnel vision. And I ended up getting a lot of like criticism for it too, where it's just like, wow, like you, you only think about climbing, like you, you're missing out on everybody's this, and everybody's that. Like a lot of people like kind of stopped talking to me because I wasn't uh, present anymore, mm -hmm. you know? And, and it's complicated because after they saw like everything that I accomplished with climbing, everybody messages you and they say, hey, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you. You're, you're wow, you've done so much. Like you've you've worked so hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you don't say. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Where's that support to begin with? I don't know. It's interesting. It's like I've had similar experiences with snowboarding and in the way that you're figuring out how to balance the two. Balance something that requires so much time mm -hmm. and dedication with making sure that you're like personal life also doesn't fall by the wayside and I think it's funny but you also do see it of people that just completely go down the rabbit hole of dedicating their life to the sport snowboarding biking climbing yeah. whatever it is yeah. even work you know yeah and then you kind of lose sight to the big picture it's it's a it's a scary one to yeah. be honest you know because at some point I just thought that my entire life was going to be focused around just like climbing climbing really hard like every decision in our personal life that my husband now would make I'm like but climbing like mm -hmm. but climbing but climbing without realizing that sometimes I would have to like kind of step back a little bit and see like the bigger picture mm -hmm. he's like it's not all about climbing you know my and it's like when you're like 70 you know you're gonna wish you had done something you know and like even when building the cabins like taking like a full month off without climbing and absolutely grinding mm -hmm. and like just watching on instagram everybody's climbing everybody's climbing I know. but you you know yeah it's it's hard but mm -hmm. then you have to remember i'm building a life for myself here mm -hmm. you know like it's at in the end of the day like i have a future that i need to take care of mm -hmm. so it's trying to balance those things. Yeah, yeah, know? balance is like kind of a never-ending, yeah, never-ending layer to it. <laughs> but you know, something that I also found very quickly as well is that you've gotten, uh, you know, obviously some shine and some success in climbing. Mm -hmm. One of which being that cover on Climbing Magazine. Mm -hmm. Let's let's like unpackage that because I think at least in the in the snowboarding world, getting a cover is a pretty uh, benchmark mm -hmm. item. It's like a bucket list item for any pro snowboarder yeah. to check off. Yeah. Could you just kind of like run me through like where were you at in your climbing when that mm -hmm. happened and maybe even just like get into the like the day and yeah. whatnot. I don't really remember w what year that came out. I think it was 21. Yeah. It was so it was after like I had already climbed like my hardest and had already got some recognition um, through it. And I didn't know I was getting the cover of Climbing Magazine until it came out. 
it was always a fun <laughs> surprise. Mm -hmm. It was it was a really big surprise, and I it was crazy. Like the amount of people like <clears throat> tagging me on Instagram and social media, and you know, like and when it came out, I was at my mom's visiting her. And she, and I was like, wow, mom, I got the cover of Quadri Magazine. She had no idea what that meant. So I was like, <laughs> she was like, oh, cool. <laughs> just like, no big deal. That's cool, you know. But it was just like, it was, it was pretty immense because so many people are like, oh, my God, that's like my ultimate, like, dream. And I never really thought about it, right? Like, that was like beyond, like, anything that I, you know, thought that could happen. So it was a big surprise. And when I went to do that photo shoot, it wasn't ever about the cover of Climbing Magazine. It was just a fun photo shoot with a friend. Just for like... Yeah, Vegas. my mom and I flew to like Vegas a... to hang out with Irene and we got yeah. up super early and she wanted to shoot this route and that's all, you know, and I didn't see a single photo of it until the cover of Climbing Magazine came out. No on. way. Yeah. Had you had like published photos prior to that? Yeah, I yeah, I had some things. I don't really remember what, but I had some things. I had, I've done a lot of like modeling work for like outdoor yeah. brands since like 2014, I think. Mm -hmm. So I had had a lot of stuff out. I landed the cover of the uh, local guidebook in Washington too, like in 2018, I think. Cool. Yeah. So I had some of that stuff um, out, but that one was like, holy cow, you know, like, mm -hmm. so then my mom goes to the local climbing gym and buys every single magazine available. God, that is so cute. Because <laughs> she's got to send it to everyone in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, it's so adorable. Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Having, like, you know, coming up and getting involved in climbing, what was, like, I'm, I kind of want to talk about media and Instagram and print media and sort of, like, how we consume media because I think there's some parallels mm -hmm. in the snowboarding space to the climbing space. When you were kind of first coming up and climbing and getting inspired by it, in snowboarding, we call it a student of the game. Mm. Uh, were you pretty? Were you following it? Were you like reading all the mags and watching videos and stuff like that? Yes, but it, only after I really got into it. Yeah. Because because before I got into it, I didn't know anything about it. I had never seen an actual like rock climbing photo. <laughs> It's totally. so stupid, but it's true. Uh, <laughs> and so, like, it was just like, you know when you don't know when you don't know, and then all of a sudden you know, and that's all you see, right? Yeah. So, and th that was the same thing. And, like, yes, social media, big gateway. Like, you know, you start consuming everything and following every climber you know and, and just, like, living and breathing that whole thing and start listening to podcasts and how to train harder and, you know, what to eat and what not to eat and all the clickbaits in the whole world, right, until you realize... It's all the same. Don't fall for it and kind of thing. Uh, but definitely, I mean, social media is like has a big. Um, it's a big presence. Presence. Yeah. yeah. And like people rely on it a lot, I mm. think, honestly. And, you know, and that's and that's how um, honestly I ended up like being seen was through social media, you know, because yeah. nowadays it's like a big way for you to get sponsorships. Right. Like mm. it's it's what you do and who sees it mm -hmm. really, you know? Yeah. So yeah. Yeah. What's your, I guess your perspective on that too. Cause I would imagine, I don't know, in, in snowboarding, there's kind of been maybe resistance. Everyone's come full circle, but there's a lot of people in snowboarding that are kind of mourning the, uh, the loss in popularity of print mm -hmm. and really trying to like stick a flag in the ground of yeah. the importance of print media yeah. and magazines and whatnot yeah. is is that something you've kind of experienced in your space as well oh for sure yeah i think that uh, things have changed so much you know and like it was only a matter of time until like the print would disappear and it's kind of sad like it's not kind of sad it's really sad yeah and i think we're all gonna grieve it for a while until we just completely forget about it and just move on what is it about <laughs> print that feels important to you? it's 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 holding something it's having it with you and being able to keep it like hidden over there in your box for like the next 20 years and being able to show someone you know it's it's available i this is stupid but i i like having things right i think growing up i didn't really have anything and then when I moved to the US I was like I can buy anything I want you know and literally sometimes I walk through the store and grab all these things that I want and then I have them for a little bit and then I can just put them back I don't have to actually buy it 
<laughs> in the store. Yes. <laughs> I own it for like 10 Wait, minutes. You, you gra- you're grabbing the like one egg fry pan thing in the grocery oh store. And you're you like, have I, no I, idea. I want that. I'm going to put that I in the car. All the things I desired. And then I have it for a little bit. I realized that I don't actually actually had it. I didn't use it. Don't need it. Can you just put it back? <laughs> <laughs> okay. I got a couple laps in. I, didn't, I don't need this anymore. Exactly. <laughs> oh. uh, wow. That's cool. You know, you touched a little bit on, on training and maybe the act of climbing. And I think that's, especially with social media and maybe how people consume climbing media. From my perspective, there's at least currently a lot of focus on, oh, if you're passionate about climbing, that means you have to get better at climbing, which means you have to train. Mm -hmm. But then you also listen, you know, you listen to like a Jonathan Seekers podcast or like Sharma or Dave Grant, any of those like OG guys. And they're just like, yeah, they actually just rock climbed a shit Climb ton more. Yeah. until they were like pretty much climbing 515 yeah. and then they started training. Yeah. Yeah. What's your take on that? Did you feel like there was a period that you consciously were like, oh, I just need to like get out if I want to get better? That's right now. I, you know, I love training. I really hmm. do. Not what necessarily it? just fingerboarding. It's the the feeling of getting better that you can actually see throughout like a month because in climbing you will climb forever until you see like progress but start deadlifting you're going to see or start like campusing and you're going to see in the month you're going to be campusing like like a boss right so the gains are you you are more visible faster and mm-hmm. it's just like that feeling that you have after like a good training session or that you just like conquer the world. It's amazing. Right. And I love lifting weights. I, I love feeling strong. I love doing weighted pull-ups, like all this, these things. So I really think that if you're training for the right reasons, because you love it and you really appreciate it and, and it's part of like, it makes you feel good. Why not? Right. And so But if if your focus is only like, oh, I'm just going to train, grind this because I want to be a better rock climber, go rock climb. (laughs) Go rock climb. Because honestly, my entire training barely translates on the wall outside ever because I don't know how to read the rock and I'm not trusting my feet. Guess what? You're only going to get better at that climbing outside. Like there's no way, you know? So it's it's that balance. It's, It's really the exposure to what you actually like your ultimate go is and your ultimate go is like send something hard outside. So, yeah, yeah, totally. I know it's interesting. Again, it's so you can get like sucked into it so quickly and thinking that that's kind of your, your like silver bullet in a way Mm -hmm. is, Oh, Mm -hmm. if I can do X amount of repeaters or something, then that will like automatically allow me to send my project or like show up to a crag outside and Mm -hmm. climb what I want. Yeah. But in reality, it's, it's funny comparing it in to my space and snowboarding because just recently, like snowboarders have always kind of trained, but it's like been pretty looked down upon. Like you would Mm -hmm. get made fun of if you Mm -hmm. trained and like publicly posted anything about training, not like (laughs) a big outcry, but Uh that was kind of the vibe. You know, it's like, we're like punk rock, yeah. you know, whatever, yeah. we're badasses, so we don't sick. train. But there's kind of some truth to it in a way, too, that I think you could see in a lot of sports. It's like, yeah, to get better at snowboarding, you kind of, you just got to do it mm-hmm. a lot, mm-hmm. you know? I don't think, yeah. it's something like surfing or climbing, right? I don't know, yeah. there's there's all these, like, very, they're so skill-based, and I think the physical aspect, especially climbing, because yeah. your initial impression is like, oh my God, look at that person's mm-hmm. muscles. Mm-hmm. Like, Jesus Christ, yeah. they must work out a lot. And yeah. it's like, no, it's it's kind of the other way around. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get asked like so much. It's like, oh my, are you like a, were you a gymnast or like a bodybuilder? And it's just like, no, dude, I just like rock climbing, yeah. you know? And like, I just have a tendency to build muscle really easily. And another thing is people are always just like, wow, your fingers are so strong. Did you see you cut feet like on those tiny holes and you stuck to the wall? I was like, yeah, my shoulders are strong, not my fingers. So there's like all these like mis- like conceptions of like training and, and everything. But like you said, it's like so skill based. Like we don't take into account like how nervous you're going to be and how much more you're going to be over gripping outside versus versus indoors where you just like know exactly what how to go to you're just like on the flow right it's not the same yeah Mm -mm. i think it's what's really cool about climbing as well is that it's like a it's a lifelong sport 
mm. which is rad. You know, you have Sharma projecting 15C in his 40s and you go to you go to like maple canyon in utah and probably half the crowd at pipe dream has like a full head of gray hair but they're climbing 514 yeah. you know it's yeah. i feel that it's easy to maybe get lost in the short term mm -hmm. and yeah. really hyper focus on what's right in front of mm -hmm. you and not maybe plan for the long term yeah what are and your thoughts on that? And I think that's why the the training is important, is that injury prevention. It's, it's like, oh, but I could be climbing for another half an hour. Yes, but you could also go do your little shoulder exercises and not get your shoulder all messed up. But I've done that so much. Like, trust me <laughs> when I say that, like, after... I got past my 30s, I realized that I can't just be climbing four days a week just for the sake of getting better and stronger faster uh, because I wasn't recovering and I was just getting injured over and over again. And I have like all these tweaks all the time and literally one like shoulder like session will like relieve so much pain. Mm -hmm. And and it's like, I, I think when we're young, we're just like, whatever, I, I know I can just do it all. I can conquer it all. And at some point, you have to remember that you can climb forever. But if you really mess up your shoulder, you're, you know, the chances are that you're not going to be able to recover that soon. And you're going to be having to sit down for like a month or two. Yeah, so, totally. Yeah. But yeah, I love just watching. Like sometimes I'm like so discouraged because I'm like, man, I started climbing so late in life. And now I'm just really old and <laughs> I'm never going to be able to climb this and this, you know. And, oh and then you see those OGs like absolutely crushing it and climbing their hardest and you're like okay never mind just like get your shit together make sure you're like doing all your pt stuff and stay healthy yeah stay healthy yeah yeah, yeah. i think that's the biggest thing that you can see in maybe any sport is and there's kind of i don't know it's maybe part of the the recipe to find success if you want is really thinking long term mm -hmm. and that even comes from thinking long term as far as okay, I'm trying this route right now. How can I set myself up to have a better day tomorrow, a mm. better week, a better month, mm -hmm. year, 10 years, right? That's and there's true. this like never ending kind of process. Yeah. At least not, that's, it seems to be a really good balance that a bunch of these successful athletes mm -hmm. find. Yeah. So that if you're never getting hurt, you're just slowly kind of building on blocks or you're just at least maintaining. Yeah, that's and true. Then, you know, before you know it, you're older and you're still sending it. And you're still sending <laughs> it. Yeah, no, it's super impressive. I mean, shoot, I want to be 60 and, you know, be strong as Eric Hurst and Chris so Sharma. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know, like they're, they're super <laughs> <Who> incredible. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Give it to me. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. And how about, I mean, you know, maybe thinking a little more long term, like it seems like we're, you know, kind of where are you at with, maybe you like your life and climbing right now and how mm -hmm. does if, it seems like you've kind of gone full circle maybe in a way or you've just like developed into this new phase yeah yeah i I've, I've got a lot going on right now right i started guiding um in 21 and i was just like oh you know i, I was given the opportunity so i took my single pitch instructor with the mga and i was just like i'm just gonna give this a try i don't really know if it's for me you know and I absolutely loved it. And I think really? I loved it because it is for like, I get to guide women, a big group of women every, every retreat. And I get to see a lot of myself when I started climbing them. Hmm. And because I didn't have a mentor, I get to teach them the lessons I've learned on my own. Yeah. And I got to tell them, hey, I know you're scared, but I have this and this experience and you're going to overcome this. And the more you climb, the better it's going to be. And I got to watch these people coming in day one, super nervous about being around a bunch of people, not really knowing much, having to trust their lives in your hands, like literally, and absolutely thriving by the last day and being so comfortable on the rock. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I just took so, such a big passion um, in it that I'm just like doing it as much as I can. It has made a huge like impact on my climbing not in a good way, just because you're dedicating a lot of your time into it, but I wouldn't have it any other way. Yeah. So I love it very, very much. And I still think that if I'm organized enough, I can still do both. 
Yeah. I just need to be a probably more prepared person. <laughs> <laughs> you can, yeah. It's always easier in hindsight. Yeah, exactly. You're saying retreats. So you've been doing some, yeah. it seems like female focused. Yeah. I guide for a retreats. company yeah, called Shimu's Mountains and they host retreats all over the world. And I've been guiding for them at Smith Rock State Park, um, Greece and Mexico, probably Spain this year as well. So lots of locations, a lot of different experiences. Some of these are five days long, which is so awesome. Some of these are like, we have seven retreats coming up um, starting end of, um, end of April at Smith Rock. So it's like from Thursday through Sunday, it's like you're on, you're hosting, like you're eating dinner with them, you're eating breakfast with them. So it's like... That's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah, it's full on. You're like, uh, you're clicked in. The yeah, whole time. The whole time you're so clicked in. It's like mentally exhausting, but it's like so satisfying. And one of the worst things is I really, really suck at names. And every weekend I have a whole new group of people. How large are the groups? <laughs> like, so they, they minimize it a lot because now we host out of Shamu's Mountains house. So it's now like between 13 and 15 every week. But it used to be like 25. That's insane. Yes. So it's it's a lot. But it's it's crazy because you start getting really attached to these people. Because, you know, like when you, like you're passionate about something together and you're like conquering new things together, like it's so fun. And then they leave. And then someone new, you know, all this new group comes out and then like the whole cycle starts over again. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Yeah. But then Summer I get to my lives. house after like this whole... I literally don't want to talk to anybody. I'm just like, give me a week. <laughs> <laughs> My husband's like, you're so different with other people in at home. I'm like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, I need to just, you know, like, chill. <laughs> Coming back from a trip, I call I call it re-entry. I like That's that. what it is, you know. And huh. I'll end up at like snowboard events too, and it'll be very <laughs> stimulating. You're either with like your film crew the whole time, and you're eat sleep snowboarding with each other every yeah. day for a week weeks yeah. or something yeah. or you know you go to an event and it's mm -hmm. catching up with people at breakfast yeah. doing snowboarding stuff all mm -hmm. day and maybe you're performing or maybe you're like guiding or something mm -hmm. whatever and then you know you're doing stuff at night you're maybe doing some media stuff yeah. and it's just this like yeah. that like yeah, yeah clicked in yeah. cycle yeah and it's a completely different mindset in yeah. the world and I feel like yeah. when you get back home and kind of have that decompressed moment. Oh, yeah. yeah. You know, all of a sudden, like, the day-to-day -day is... There's, I don't know, there's, like, I'm, like, clunky at it's it. It's so true. It's so true. You're so clunky at it. Like, nothing, like, nothing... You can't do anything. Like, I even have a hard time adapting again to my, my lifestyle at home. I know. Is How funny it's is that, so too? How weird. quickly yeah. you adapt yeah. to one yeah. lifestyle versus the other. It's and, so weird. And, and it's the same. Maybe yeah. it, I'm curious how it is for your, your husband as well, because, like, for my, my wife, it's, like, it's kind of, like, messes up her schedule, too, because she is she is a she's a teacher so she has a pretty consistent schedule yeah. and and then I'll get home and my my gears all over the house yeah. on like a Tuesday night and I sleep until nine the first day but then I'm up at five the next day yeah. <laughs> like, my husband's always like that he's just like you're just gone forever I mean last year I was gone for two full months like gone gone yeah and you know and then you get home and you want to be all about you like we need to like <laughs> make a deal here <laughs> and I'm like okay sounds good but he's just like what are you doing are you so burnt out and it's and it's not that you're not being yourself is that you're always giving your best self yeah and we it, care about it, it. it yeah exactly and it, it it becomes exhausting you know it's not it's not that you're faking or anything. It's just that you're working really hard to just present the best that you can and show compassion and empathy, you yeah. know, like through the process. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Dang, that's, mm -hmm. that's really cool. Yeah. So with, you said She Moves Mountains is the organization. Mm -hmm. You got a bunch of stuff coming up this, I guess, summer. Yeah, this spring. Spring, summer. Spring, yeah. summer. I, I, um, I try to not do anything in the summer for them just because the spring is so packed and it just takes so much that I kind of need some time for myself. Yeah. And that's when I'm actually going to hopefully be in the same place for a while that I can actually go and like project. Yeah. But the, the truth is that things just kind of start showing up and it's just like, hey, there's a shoot here, there's a shoot there. And all of a sudden I'm like gone. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so. How have you gone about trying to balance maybe the dedication it takes to maintain fitness with okay, yeah, there's like this modeling shoot or there's maybe a, something else that's popped up. So like 
can you maybe speak on how you've gone about, and this is actually uh, like, could help me out because mm. I, I struggle. Like I look at people with nine to fives and I'm like, man, you can just like dial in your schedule oh. so well. What's your approach to that? Or yeah. maybe, maybe you just like sacrifice all of it and you caution to the yeah. wind. I think that I was so like psyched about climbing and like how fast I was going through the grades when I started climbing because I had a nine to five and it was just really easy to just like be super consistent and I found out the hard way that that's not the truth. <laughs> that's not the truth when you don't have that and your work, like, it's all over the place, right? And some places you go and you can't really have a place to climb at all or a place to work out at all and might as well go for a run in the morning or whatever. But most of the time, honestly, I'm just too exhausted. And what I feel every time I go back home is that I'm trying to catch up to where I was. And I think that's where it's really hard to, like, find the balance, right? Because mm -hmm. you're like, okay, I'm super psyched. I'm back home and start training again, but you can't overdo it. Otherwise you're going to get injured. So it's, it's been this, like trying to get back into it for a long time. And I, one thing I noticed too, is that I sacrificed my eating as well. And like, you know, mm -hmm. my health eating habits that mm -hmm. I re eat really well at home. But every time I'm traveling, I'm like, treat myself. And then yeah. I realize, Hey, I'm always traveling. <laughs> you can't treat yourself. I have that. Yeah. I yeah. understand that completely. Yeah. What's on your radar for this summer then? You said like ideally you're able to like want to settle into one place. Mm -hmm. Is that like training back home or do you have a location that you want to go post up at? And We just bought a house and I think that we want to be kind of more stationed, you know, just like more family focused in a way. So I think the good thing about Washington is that there is a lot of hard stuff that I could go and, and tackle and a lot of people that are super psyched to do it. So... I think that my focus is going to be um, climbing in that area. And there is an area called Index, which is a lot of tread climbing and a lot of granite. And I don't feel like I'm the best granite climber. So one of my goals is just to like get more used to it and climb a lot of it. So <laughs> those are my two main goals. But I'm also like trying to like um, add something extra in my life right now, which is firefighting. And so I just started like getting into like interviewing and, and things like that and it's been going way better than I expected so you know I think it's just kind of wait and see what happens next yeah totally yeah. how maybe expand a little bit on the whole firefighting thing because I think there's I've met other climbers that have taken well to firefighting I've trained with some firefighters and get a real, along well with them and then there's also been some snowboarders that have gone into firefighting mm -hmm. and they also were like it's really sick. Mm -hmm. I, what do you think translates maybe from, I guess you as a person, but more so like climbing mm -hmm. that seems to feel like it's a good fit to go into firefighting? Yeah. I, I think it's a problem solving aspect of, uh, of climbing that translates really well into firefighting because in firefighting, you're always like having to like uh, problem solve under stressful situations and I feel like when you're like on your limit on a climbing wall or snowboarding you have to think quick right and in firefighting is exactly the same thing and one one of the other things that we love about sports is that we get to do with other people and share that experience and in firefighting you're always working with a team so and then my husband my husband's a firefighter himself and he always says well the three three biggest strengths of firefighters in like physical is like shoulder strength finger like um, grip strength and leg strength you've got the shoulder strength and the grip strength so all you need to do is like start squatting or whatever <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm like great sounds good um but you, you know I just always wanted like the career like something that I could feel like like being the front line do something crazy you know I even thought about like joining the air force at one point and you know when I decided that I wanted to be a firefighter I was just like man th this is it this is so cool like I get to learn all these new things and it's going to be awesome so I I don't know where it's going to lead yet you know it's just like a a wish right now but all you got to do is try there you go yeah simply put yeah <laughs> Man, well, I feel like we've covered quite a bit. It's been really cool to like catch up and get to know you and get some of your perspective and hear some of your story and just your general approach has been really rad. And I feel like we covered a lot of ground. It's been really cool to catch up with you, really just to get maybe your perspective on your approach to climbing, your approach to life and mm -hmm. how your origins have kind of shaped who you've become today. Uh, it's, it's really inspiring to see someone that is... 
outspokenly trying to balance life with um, just the requirements, trying to be like an elite athlete it takes, you know? <laughs> so thank you. And I sort of just wanted to extend the, uh, the floor to you to see if there's any thank yous you wanted to share. I'd like to say things that I'm thankful for. Um, this is great. This is a first. Definitely thankful for the opportunity to have moved into this country and being accepted here. And even though for so long it felt like I didn't belong here or I, I felt like I couldn't really dream about anything because I wasn't sure how long I was going to be able to stay here, I was fully accepted and uh, fully embraced into the culture. Um, and I, I never felt like I was looked down upon. Like I always felt super accepted, super loved by anyone and everyone and super welcomed. And I, I, you know, that makes me emotional, honestly. Like it's, it's just been such a long life story and like so many struggles. And I feel like I've truly accomplished like my American dream in this country. And I'm thankful for my mom who's like fought so hard to bring me here and to give me a better life, you know? And sometimes like she feels so sorry because she couldn't get me through college or all these things. But I, I think she forgets to realize, like she doesn't realize like how much she has done and worked for, for me and my family. Um, and she's like the hero of our family, you know, and she's my best friend too. And like, I, I'm just so thankful for it. Wow. That's awesome. Shout out, shout out mom. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, this has been great again. Thank you. Really appreciate it. And thank you to everyone who tuned in. Hopefully you enjoyed the show. If you did, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And in the meantime, from the crew at Backcountry, we will see you out there.